With that cursory introduction to Semiramis, we can now explore the central monument of Nimrod's capital city, the Tower of Babel. This monument, commissioned by Nimrod, would be his power base, his castle, his palace, his throne. It's estimated that around 600,000 people were gathered together for its construction, and we find the motivation for it in Genesis 11 where the people say, Come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. These lofty words may remind you of those spoken by Lucifer and Isaiah and Ezekiel. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. Notice the words, sacred mountain, the idea that God resides atop a mountain. It is repeated again in Ezekiel 28 when God says, You sinned, therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. Now the Tower of Babel is often misrepresented in paintings. You'll often see it look something like this. But it was actually a kind of ziggurat, which is a pyramid-like shape. Indeed, from the Babylonian ziggurats we get similar structures in Egypt, Africa and South America, remains of which can still be seen today and are amongst the world's most beloved tourist attractions. The reason that they are this particular shape is that they were built to represent mountains. Satan wants to be like God, he therefore mimics him in every way. The people Satan influences do likewise. Just as Satan wanted to ascend to the mountain of God to become God, the people he influenced were the same. Nimrod built the Tower of Babel to represent a sacred mountain, at the top of which he would have his throne room, his heaven, and he would rule from there not just as a king but as a god. It represents the deification of man, the idea that man can become a god. It is the old serpent's lie from Eden. Nimrod's subjects would have to ascend up the steps of the mountain for his council. In a city full of low-lying, flat-topped roofs, he would literally be the most high amongst them, a constant visual reminder to the people of his supremacy. Wherever they were within Babylon and for miles around, they would see the top of the tower and to know that their king and God was keeping a watchful eye over them from heaven, monitoring their every move. This would strike a mixture of fear and awe into his subjects. Nimrod was the initiator of the idea of emperor worship, although it may not have been his idea originally. Evidence suggests that Semiramis was actually the brains behind this concept, and that it was a clever device for helping them keep a tight grip on their subjects. She appeared to understand that a surefire route to gaining earthly honour, prestige and power is through religious authority. Spiritual authority secures temporal authority. Nimrod was more than happy to go along with it, just as Adam was happy to go along with Eve in the Garden of Eden. By turning himself into a god and establishing emperor worship as a common practice, he maintained control over his subjects. Because of his association with fire and the sun, he became known as the Sun God. His consort, Semiramis, understandably became associated with the other leading light in the sky, a moon goddess. Around themselves as the sun and moon gods, they created an entire religion that was based on a corruption of primeval astronomy developed by Noah's righteous ancestors prior to the flood. This religion has come to be known as the mystery religion.